We are activating your unique self-discovery one show at a time. The Orchard of Wisdom Self-Discovery Podcast are at your fingertips, just waiting to inspire and invite you in discovering just how awesome you really are and how to navigate through life in joy, enrichment, personal abundance, in mind, body, spirit, heart and soul. All the people we bring you are here to serve you on your journey of life. Do enjoy our next show. Yes. Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, everybody. Welcome back to another edition of Their Story Matters, right here on selfdiscoverymedia.com. I'm your host, Sarah Troy, and my guest, all the way from New York, where he has wonderful temperatures today, is Kevin Hallinan. From over the wall, from the dangerous streets of New York City, and through the birth of counterterrorism and beyond. The Lieutenant Kevin M. Halliman has venture packed an insightful journey through the evolution of law enforcement, the rise of counterterrorism, and the birth of modern sports security. Uh, we have a lot here to talk about. He's been there right at the beginning. His hard scribed NYC upbringing through the NYPD ranks to command America's first joint task force on terrorism alongside the FBI. Kevin lived a lot of history from beat cop to detective. He's maneuvered through some of America's most volatile decades and saw from the inside the tenuous gray line between law and order. The job proved to be extremely isolating and it was almost hair triggering. Early in his career, he became embroiled in deadly mob cases, which pulled him under security of the feared and historic Knapp Commission on the Police Corrupt, uh, on the police corrupt Corruption. <clears throat> Excuse me today, folks, I have a little tickle in the throat. In extreme danger and under pressure, he preserved and kept his integrity intact. Higher ups took notice and brought him in into the chief detective's office where he helped recognize robbery squads and create innovative and responsive new police initiatives. And one such effort helped bring awareness and sensitivity to sexual assault investigations and contributed to the creation of the revolutionary Special Victims Unit, which I'm sure everybody has seen a version of that on TV. As the 80s unfolded, deadly attacks on the police, diplomatic missions and corrupt targets escalated through the city. Kevin replied on mentoring and growing a network of law enforcement no notables. It was compiling this amazing human network that made him the perfect choice to help pull together and lead the pioneering FBI NYPD Joint Terrorism Task Force. The JTTF, as it was came to be known, would go on to create many of counterism tools, tactics, and help America safe to this very day. After retiring from law enforcement, he began a new chapter as an executive director of security facilities managing the Major League Baseball. So there, the security for um, teams started to happen. You've really seen it all, haven't you, Kevin? Welcome to the show. Thank you very much, uh, Sarah. Yes, as you said, it was a great opportunity right from the beginning. Mm. We do have a delay here, folks, today. Nothing we can do anything about. So if you hear a pause between things, nobody's gone to sleep. We've just got a little delay going on there. So, Kevin, uh, being a cop at any time, you're putting your life on the line. And when you first started, the, I would imagine there was a great deal of unrest and really not a lot of, a lot of definition on police work. Sarah, that's that's very descriptive. You're absolutely right. Uh, you went out there with uh, a shield <laughs> uh, and a gun. And uh, at that time, there were no radios or, or telephones or a way you could call for help. You were pretty much on your own. And you were given uh, four or five streets uh, which you had to patrol. Uh, by by yourself and deal with whatever came up in that particular area and uh, believe me it it was very interesting but at the same time it was educational i learned how to deal with people uh in turmoil who were looking to the police for help and i quite honestly right from the beginning felt that 
I wanted to make a difference, uh, maybe in just a, a small way, to make things better just by appearing on the scene. And I think that uh, that attitude was something that I kept throughout my 25 years in law enforcement. And most fortunate, I worked alongside men and women who believed in me and gave me an opportunity to learn and to grow. And it, it made a difference as I had a career that I traveled through the ranks, though I have to admit there was a lot of study in, involved. <laughs> but uh, it was a city in turmoil. So, you know, doing our job as a police officer in New York City at that time, there were four or five bank robberies a day. There were bombings uh, by eight or nine different groups at the time. Uh, it, it just was chaos. And going to work each day was to expect the unexpected. Yeah, we we don't understand that. I mean, nowadays they can cell phone, they, you know, the, there's um, helicopters that can fly over. I mean, you know, just contactable with each other, you know, at a fingertips. But um, a beat cop, you know, I call a community cop. You get to know the people in your area. They get to know you. There's a trust that is built up. And you know who you know to look out for and who to be weary of and you would have people speak to you because they felt that you were there to protect their community but at the same time being on your own yes that's also very... made you volatile absolutely that that was just the situation and and, and you had to come each day each night our our tour of duty would actually shift. We'd work uh, 8 to 4, then 4 to 12 the next week, then midnight to 8 the next week. So we were meeting, uh, if you will, people at all different hours. Yeah. And uh, when people would call on you, uh, I can tell you that uh, I was responsible for the delivery of two babies in my <laughs> first year on patrol. <laughs> and uh, I, I remember... Uh, a, a young Spanish boy running up to me and saying, hey, cop, my mother needs you. And uh, <laughs> I went up to that apartment and I have to say, uh, Sarah, she truly needed me. And I, I said to uh, the woman who was pregnant, brother, I, 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 all I could think of was hot water. <laughs> I said, hot water, hot water. She ran me a bath. I don't know whether she thought I needed it or what, but uh, <laughs> anyway... Um, it, it was it was my first call home uh, that day to tell my wife. Uh, I ended up the father of four children, so I guess I should have known something about it. Exactly, exactly. We never know what you're going to be called to do, right? Whether it cat up the tree, delivering a baby, um, you know, stopping a violent crime. Um, or protecting someone from a violent crime is that each day would be whatever's going to happen is going to happen, right? Sarah, absolutely. And in fact, one day came into work and at this point in time, I guess I had about four or five years on the police force at that time. Uh, the captain of the precinct called me and my my patrol car partner in and said, I want, I want you to meet somebody. And there was a gentleman sitting there who looked sort of familiar. And he introduced himself. I'm Lieutenant Colonel John Glenn, the astronaut hmm. who had had a ticket tape parade in New York some weeks before. And instead of saying he was going to Disneyland, he said his dream was to ride in a New York City police car for a whole tour. And the city <laughs> recognized his need, and Colonel Glenn was with us for a full eight hours, and it was quite a tour of duty. Oh, I can imagine. I mean, the stories he had to share, and then people recognizing him with you. I mean, in sure, it kind of gave the, you know, the cops some celebrity status. 
Yes, for sure. And some years later, after I left uh, law enforcement, I was called back to ride in a, in a second ticker tape parade when he did his second tour in space. And my son was a New York City police officer. And uh, he was the driver. And I sat next to him. And Colonel Gwynn and his wife sat up on the back of his convertible. And the ticker tape was flying. And it was a, a tremendous day. Finished with a, with a reception at City Hall. So the some days were really good. Yes. They make up for the other days um, that aren't. You know, I, I remember a friend of mine who was a cop here in Canada. And he was saying, <clears throat> finding a child whose mother had just been killed in front of him by the child's father. And the father was going to kill the child. And he said finding this child and the terror that this child was in and what it had witnessed will stay with him forever. So yes, those wonderful days that you keep as a good memory, but I'm sure you've got days that you wish you could forget. When I was uh, a sergeant in the chief of detectives office, I was leaving work one evening and I was about four or five miles from LaGuardia Airport when a, the police radio announced that there had been a bombing at LaGuardia Airport and all available detectives should uh, get there as soon as possible. Well, I was probably only 15, 20 minutes away and I went direct to LaGuardia Airport and it was a rainy, snowy night and it was the worst scene with all my bombing scenes that I went to. This was the worst I had ever seen. And ironically, a chief uh, of police in Queens was one of the first there. Uh, it was me and him and maybe two or three others at that, at the, at that time. And he said to me, I want you to set up a morgue down on this floor and he said, stay with it and give me a full accounting at the end of the, the night or morning. Well, I went into that and found uh, a airport employee who could help me. We, we got a room and 12 bodies were brought in that night. Travelers, I mean, uh, and I remember one in particular, 21 year old young man who was a limo driver who had come to pick up somebody at the airport. And obviously he was one of the fatalities that night. We were there until the early morning hours and the damage and uh, the whole, it, the scene just driving home that morning. And I tell you what, just talking about it, I think about it again, it was, it was horrific. And, and and very sad. And I wasn't in the terrorist task force yet. Mm -hmm. That was to come. But that was my first bombing scene. And once I joined up with the FBI in the terrorist task force, that became part of my life. Yes, I would imagine. I, I never understand why people choose to take out innocence to prove a point. You know, every single one of these lives has you know, a life to live. They belong to someone. Uh, they have a life in front of them. And yet somebody wants to make a political statement or religious statement, and they don't care who they make it with. And I think it's very cowardly, you know, for people to do that. If, if you want to fight for something, then you fight, you know, the face to face, or you fight who you perceive as the enemy. You don't go after innocence. And uh, it, it's a very cowardly act, I believe. Yes, it was. And uh, it, and again, as I learned, this particular group was a Croatian group. Uh, they called themselves freedom fighters. It was, uh, you know, uh, it didn't match with their, their activities. But before we were finished uh, in our initial work over four or five years, because that's how long it took with eight or nine different groups investigating at the same time. 
And when I went into it at first, Sarah, I was somewhat intimidated by it because I had been an investigator almost my whole career in a detective bureau, homicides, drugs, et cetera, et cetera. Mm -hmm. Terrorism to me was, was you know, the unknown. Yeah. And I was praying that I was equipped to deal with this. And again, through a lot of help from FBI agents and, and New York City detectives, who got me uh, up to speed in a hurry, and I got educated and learned uh, what the, each one was about. And the, and the difficulty for us at that time to avoid infiltration mm. by law enforcement, there was linkage between these groups. They came together. They were sharing intelligence. They were sharing uh, weapons. They were sharing explosives. And and it became <clears throat> even more difficult uh, to uh, uh, you know identify them. And it took in one instance uh, with a group that did one uh, a uh, killing of two police officers and a bring some a car driver up in, in New York, twenty five miles north of New York City, and there were eight different groups involved in that. And when we hit a safe house. That day on October 1st, 19, I'm sorry, October 20th, 1982, four different safe houses. We found explosives. Mm. We found automatic weapons, ammunition, phony identification. And in one safe house, we found <clears throat> plans of four different police precincts in New York in which their plan was to bomb each one of these precincts and would automatic West kill any of the police officers that might run out of the building. So this was a vicious group. Right. They were determined, they were intelligent, and they went around doing armored car robberies and they would scope them out, what they called target assessment. The one they get, did uh, in North of New York City was a three-month look to see where the most money would be picked up, where was the greatest opportunity, and what kind of a statement would it make, and escape routes, and, and, and all the rest. took five years, but we got every one of them. Good. Were there some mili uh, you know, military people in that? Because when you look at that kind of strategy and planning, you know, it kind of suggests that some of them had come from the military. Yes, there were there were several that had had uh, military background mm. and uh, were familiar with automatic weapons and, and with explosives. Uh, and there were other political people who believed that they had to uh, uh, go after the government and uh, any means necessary. Right. We don't create change that way. I mean, you know, um, home terrorism, uh, overseas terrorism, terrorism only terrifies people. It doesn't bring about any change. If you really want change, you've got to vote it in. You've got to create the change, but not through violence. Violence only brings about more angst and anger. It does, does not bring about solutions. You're right. Violence breeds violence. Yes. For sure. And by the way, I, what was important in the book was the fact that in the New York City Police Department and the FBI coming together for the first time in this particular area. And actually, what helped was the fact that bank robberies were, you know, six, seven bank robberies a day in New York police cars in front of banks when they weren't on assignment. And that was so successful in bringing it to a close. Finally, the higher ups decided that terrorism needed the same combination of law enforcement. And that really was a difference maker and bringing it uh, by 1985, we had made over 100 arrests of domestic terrorists. Again, with a lot of help from other police departments throughout the United States, 
from the federal authorities, United States attorneys, and others who were difference makers. And that's the, that's the importance that really needs to be driven home. Each department has their own expertise. Each department maybe has a particular area that they're looking at. And it's only when you all start talking with each other that you actually gather the whole picture and that you actually can collaboratively together, you know, resolve an issue. And if one department is keeping the other one in the dark, who is it serving? Absolutely no one. You need, you need that, you know, cohesive collaboration in order to get anything done. Sarah, you're so right. As I had mentioned earlier about linkage of the terrorist group they came together, it was certainly important for law enforcement, and most particularly, not only in New York City, but throughout the United States. And in this particular case, I talked about the two police officers. They were small town police officers and a Brinks guard that were killed. That seemed to set the message to law enforcement that we all, you know, had a target on our back yeah. and we had to do this together. And it took a lot of time and effort, but it made a difference. And I, I should also mention in 1982, New Year's Eve, the FALN, Puerto Rican Independent Group, put down five bombs in New York City. And, and seriously wounded three New York City police officers. That group had done unbelievable damage and they targeted the terrorist task force, our office, the United States attorneys, courthouse, police uh, uh, headquarters in Manhattan. And they were a very, very active group. They had a, probably over 140 bombings to their credit and probably 19, 1975, the Francis Tavern in New York, where diners, innocent people having lunch, uh, were killed by a bomb that they uh, brought in and planted. So they, they didn't care about innocent people, you know, who had nothing to do with, uh, you know, their issue or anything else. But it was most important that law enforcement be unified and be committed to making sure that it was going to be brought to an end. Gangs. Um, I mean, when, when poverty is around, there is room for exploitation. Um, when families are divided, uh, when people are struggling, there is always going to be exploitation. And gangs are very, very good at recruiting people that are either from broken families or poor families or just trapped in an environment where they feel there's nothing else. Um, I'm sure you have seen your fair share of gangs in New York. Yes, I have. And unfortunately, in many instances, uh, drugs become yeah. a big part of that. And uh, I got involved uh, as a young sergeant uh, in a homicide unit in the Bronx, and my first day in reporting for duty almost was my last, and that's a, an interesting story for the book, but uh, what happened, there were three major groups that were fighting for control of the drug business in the Bronx. They had 26 homicides between them of oh. their own people, where they were actually taking, I don't want to get too far in depth on this one, but taking people and taking them into a basement of a building, strapping them down, and then, uh, if you will, performing their own surgery. This is, it, 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 they were an unbelievable vicious group. And it took, it took time and a group of detectives that I ended up working with called Team C. Team C did such a terrific job that, uh, I told a bit of the story at a communications class that I was taking in uh, for a master's degree. <laughs> and uh, the professor turned out to be a uh, reporter for the New York Times. And he thought the story was unbelievable. And 
he got the times to cover it and it turned out to be a front page story in the new york times for six consecutive days called wow. the 138th street war this was 1979 uh the Reporters won awards, and the fact wrote a screenplay after it. But uh, it was it was a a group of detectives who I was fortunate enough to work alongside, who were the difference makers. They were putting their lives on the line every day. They were up against them, and that I go into some detail about that story. But before that, Sarah, again, organized crime also was on the scene in East Harlem uh, in Manhattan. And I ended up in the middle of a, a situation where two organized crime uh, individuals killed someone at about 3.30 in the morning. I ended up with the case and it was quite involved. They showed up one night at the precinct where I was working and wanted to, uh, were offering me in their words, telephone numbers, if I would uh, walk away from the case and not pursue it. Well, I walked away from them as I kicked them out of the, the office, <laughs> and it you. took almost two years. I got, I got both of them, and, but it was uh, the NAP Commission, as uh, was mentioned, and the Internal Affairs Division, uh, were just kind of stoking around, thinking that maybe I had something to do with uh, these people still being on the loose. And I did never worked any harder on a case than I did on that one. And uh, it took a while, but eventually they had wired up a police officer in, in the precinct where I was a detective. And he asked one of the people involved, hey, what about the guy upstairs? Uh, the detective, and they said, don't tell him, he'll lock us all up. And uh, fortunately, they finally got hold of that tape and uh, looked at me in another way. But this was all the types of pressure and, uh, you know, unbelievable experience. I had a tremendous wife who uh, was very supportive during that whole time that really made a difference. And, uh, she allowed me, uh, if you will, to live these things. And 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 as I used to say, I left my armor at the bridge. I didn't bring the stories home or anything like that. But she probably knew when I was under pressure. But it was a great experience. But Sarah, it, what I think I want to tell young people thinking about policing, it was very rewarding. I met some unbelievable people. There were a lot of good people that helped pave my way in law enforcement. You know, and, you know, you know, look at all the other things that you've done. I mean, the, um, put my glasses on to make sure that I'm actually, not only have you written the book, you know, Over the Wall, but also the, um, the, the anti-terrorism task force, obviously, which is really, really important and, and still very much around today, but also to do with the, um, I'm looking for it here, the, a uh, special victims unit, which of course we you know we see these cases on law and order and you know all of that. I mean, how many of those cases? I don't know if you watch Law and Order, but you know how many of those special victims unit one? How many of those cases do you look at on the TV show and go nowhere near the truth or way too close to the truth? Well, Sarah, you know it's. Uh, uh, I, I think some of my colleagues are involved in the uh, the. Uh, expert uh, uh, stories that have been mm -hmm. being told, but it was, and, and again, I was part of a team of people that uh, realized that the way we were working uh, sexual crimes against women was was just not not the way to do it. I mean- now The woman it, was, was being doubly victimized, wasn't she? That's exactly yeah. right, exactly. I mean, it, it came down to something as simple as, how about having a woman answer the phone in the sex crime unit? Yeah, you know, it 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 became uh, so important across the board because it not only impacted the detectives uh, and, and obviously more importantly the victims, but the district attorney's office got involved. They had some uh, terrific 
uh, assistant DAs in that office, uh, particularly the Manhattan was really where it started. And these women, and I mentioned their names in the book, they just were pathfinders. Mm. And so much so that they came from Europe, they came from Canada, they came from all over to follow just what path we had taken to kind of build this interest and success in bringing down uh, uh, rape, sexual assault. I mean, it was, uh, quite honestly, the uh, the people that, that got involved, many of them got promoted and, and well, they should have for, yeah. for what they did. But NYPD, uh, as we like to say, is really a, a laboratory. And if it works in New York, it's going to work anyway. Right. Very, very apropos. You know, a woman who's been victimized, the biggest problem is, um, will anybody believe me? Does anybody care? And when, you know, where we look at them being um, questioned, you know, again, it's almost they've got to prove it. Uh, and it's yes, you do have the cases where it's wrongful, uh, uh, you know, accusatory of someone of rape when they never did it. Somebody getting back at someone. But most of the time it is women who are or young men to being victimized and sexual abuse is nothing to sniffle at. This has repercussions on these people's lives forever, forever. Uh, it will always be a scar. It will always be something that will get in the way of relationships. It will always be a trust factor for them. And if it's not handled right at the beginning, that victimization and feeling they have no one to trust is going to go with them through their whole lives. You're Sarah, you hit it on the head. And that really was the most important part of, of showing the interest and caring that, that we're going to go to, to great lengths to make sure that we're doing the right thing, that people feel comfortable with, with, with whom they're dealing with. And they know yeah. that we're not going to leave any stone unturned to make sure that the person responsible is going to be taken into custody and it's going to be dealt with. And when you got the courts and the assistant district attorneys working alongside you. And I believe it or not, the judges also uh, uh, stood up and took notice mm. of what was going on and, 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 and what was happening. This is, there was a, a sergeant, believe it or not, he was the only male member of this uh, a sex crime unit, Sergeant Harry O'Reilly, who was just absolutely terrific. Uh, when he retired, he ended up lecturing uh, throughout the United States and overseas on on the uh, special victims unit and and what was done and the difference that it made yeah. so important and and it's unfortunate it took too long to get recognized yes i mean you know now we have you know exponentially sex trafficking which is you know billion dollar industry a year and uh, you know it, i i've done shows on this and People think it's just homeless kids or poor kids, but sex traffickers target uh, well-to-do kids as well. You know, meet them at the sporting events. Uh, you know, mom and dad won't let you have that tattoo. Hey, I've got a friend who will do it for you. Um, and sometimes it's not all to do with ransom. Sometimes it is selling the girls. And, you know, we we still don't really pay enough attention to that, do we? I know Deep Dark Web. It's a very much of an underground thing. But I think once we really do pull the string on that and unravel it and see the kind of people that are involved with this, it is not all, you know, rich businessmen or, or sheiks. Very often it is judges. It is uh, people in political power. It is these all these people. And we really do need to pull the pull the thread on that and unravel it. Sarah, you're right, and and I do know, and it actually happened uh, after I left. But the professional sports teams mm -hmm. uh, have uh, taken notice of that. I know there was a lot of uh, work done with the Super Bowl with the NFL, and and that was something, by the way, that I championed when I got at the baseball. Uh, the leagues clearly uh, 
felt that, uh, you know, you do your thing and we'll do ours. But I brought them together. And uh, I actually, I think I can say this publicly, uh, I got them to agree to make a state-of-the-art video, not a grade B movie, but a state-of-the-art video uh, called Gambling With Your Life, because many of our, our players in all the leagues were targets by organized crime. And it was really important that we recognize this. And as I've learned very quickly, talking head really didn't get it done. Mm -hmm. You had to put something up there in the screen and and make it real. And what I what I did again with uh, if you will fifty grand from each professional league, including baseball, made a start a state of the art video, in which I had a good script, I had good music, I had a former captain in the Colombo crime family, a very articulate guy who. Uh, Actually, quit the mob, and he did uh, as a captain and uh, uh, attractive women in the story. And those players, let me tell you something. This was so successful in telling a story that how they are fair game for organized crime and in getting them involved with gambling, uh, or drugs, women, whatever it is going to be. These players had a chance to make a good decision not to get involved. And I ended up, quite honestly, I did nine other videos on all subjects that were important to professional athletes, not only baseball players, but all the other leagues as well. When Major League Soccer came into business, they joined. And just one last commercial I'll do here. Uh, I also brought in uh, the team program on alcohol management for all of our stadiums to clearly make it a family uh event and and the importance of of making sure that with regard to drunk driving that we are impacting there so there were just so many opportunities uh, unfortunately um, some of these areas you know for whatever reasons were, were not uh dealt with and uh, the baseball just gave me full throttle go after it and make it happen it's going to be uh, the best for baseball and best for our communities i wish you had it here for hockey canada it's going through a whole thing here right now of um you know a, a rape um, by some various members and and how they paid the woman off with funds that they had got, you know, from donations. And uh, a lot of people have been fired. It's been under absolute scrutiny. Uh, people have withdrawn their sponsorships. And, you know, perhaps if, if they had had a movie like this, kind of warning them and holding them responsible for actions, you know, it may not have happened. So I don't know if these things are still, movies like this are still happening. But, uh, you know, you've got people that suddenly are under fame and popularity and money and people throwing themselves at them and they don't know where to draw the line and we need to train them you know all people of power need to understand there is still consequences and responsibility with your power right, and not to abuse it sarah you're right and i think what happened uh, clearly with baseball and the other sports as well and with our athletes we were reactive, mm -hmm. okay, instead of being proactive. We were, they were waiting until after it happened and then trying to deal with it. Such as a, what we had to do, educational front, in a positive way, in an attractive way. These players, I can tell you, in spring training, I dealt with 30 different teams. I do the same act 30 times, but when I went in, it was like an off-Broadway show. I wanted them to not only understand, but enjoy the presentation and realize that this was important to their careers. It wasn't about me. It was mm -hmm. about them. And they had to take responsibility, as I used to tell them, you know, you, you were six or seven years old and because you could hit a ball or throw a ball, uh, people w were giving you, uh, you had an American Express card when you were 10. Mm -hmm. So it was important if, Somebody said a player, and he was absolutely right. It takes tough to get into professional 
baseball or the other sports, but it's even more difficult to stay there. Yes. So they had to learn and they had to grow from the experience. Yes. As everybody does, no matter where they are, who's going to go for pop stars and in now we've got social media stars, you know, everybody, there are boundaries and learn what they are. Let's talk about corruption. Um, corruption is everywhere. Um, it is in police forces. It is in, you know, it's everywhere. Um, but, you, you know, you mentioned corruption, you know, earlier in your, in your piece there. How much corruption was actually going on in the New York, uh, either police force or commissioners or whatever, you know, and how was it combated? How was it revealed? Sarah, what happened was uh, the New York City Police Department had what they called a plain clothes unit, which dealt with vice, okay, mm -hmm. with drugs, with gambling, with prostitution. And there had been in I should say, uh, infiltration to a degree by organized crime uh, with this particular group of uh, vice officers. They were getting, uh, on a monthly basis, mm -hmm. payoffs to turn their head and not uh, uh, minimum, minimum uh, enforcement. And... Uh, police officer who famous case, Serpico, uh, the movie Serpico uh, was uh, uh, Academy Award winner. That that ended up a police officer by the name of Serpico went into that unit and realized what was happening. Mm. And for a period of time, he put up with it. He wouldn't take any of the money. He let his, his partner take the money, but he just wanted to do his job. Well, finally, he realized that this was never ending. And he went to the, uh, actually, that was the start of the Knapp Commission. And there was a whole investigation and police officers were arrested. And they did a, and the Knapp Commission did a good job. Uh, I think quite honestly, they should have went on to other city agencies and and, uh. and, and, and package up. But uh, it, it was something that uh, the New York City police uh, needed. Uh, because of what was going on. And there were a lot of controls put in effect that monitored all of these activities that had uh, caused all these problems and quite honestly have made a difference. Not that we don't have an occasional right. derelict, but uh, it's 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 cleaned up quite substantially. The department and uh, with all that's going on, we're losing a lot of people uh, to retire early retirements mm -hmm. and recruiting has gotten tough too because of the difficulties of being a policeman now. Yes. Um, I had last week a woman on who was living in uh, Mexico and her husband was Mexican. She was American. So he had dual citizenship and they had created jobs and uh, the village was thriving because of them, but they got caught up in a con when they rented a house while they were building. And uh, it ended up with um, uh, 20 of these people with machetes coming to their place, killing their animals, threatening their lives, and the police standing there. And the person who had done the con was the daughter of the commissioner, and these police and the commissioner were all under the cartel. And their lives were completely threatened. And it was actually the villagers that came to their rescue. Otherwise, they would have been dead. And, you know, this is you hear these stories all over the place. I've done stories with people in India where the corruption and the political level of money raised to do this and to do that. And it never reaches where it's meant to go. So, you know, corruption is there. Um, and accountability needs to be there. But I think the great deal of it is we need to raise the consciousness of the individual as to the price that others are going to pay for your actions. And do you really want that karma on you? Do you really want to carry that heavy burden of the sorrow that you're going to cast by your corruption? So that there has to be some sort of inner consciousness, doesn't there? Yes, there has to be, and there really has to be a lot of work, as I 
mentioned on the proactive side in preventing and and one of one of the things they they were doing i suspect they still are uh, some of the policemen that were involved in those activities years back who ended up doing prison time, et cetera, were actually brought back, not the officers, but to come into the police academy and talk about how they started out, that they were honest and they were law-abiding and how slowly but surely they fell into some corrupt practices and and that 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 gets across. Mm -hmm. uh, people see that when they look at an individual whose life has been uh, you know severely damaged because of uh, their mistakes. So I, I I really think that helps. Yes, yeah. You know this. It may seem more glorious at the time, but there is always a price to pay. Always. Yes. And, and uh, well, you know, uh, Sarah, on a more professional level, if you will, I uh, when I was in training, training detectives in the chief of detectives office, I uh, went out and found uh, a uh, a robber, a guy who was uh, had been uh, arrested uh, for robbery and was with three others when they uh, went into a parking lot and they were ripping off cars and a uh, customer walked in he turned out to be a detective and uh though so they took his gun and shield and then three of them wanted to kill him and this one guy said no don't kill him uh and and these four did some months later and the detective testified in the case of the man who saved his life and uh he, he got a much wider sentence but he had been doing armed robberies for quite a while. And uh, I got him when he was in jail to come and talk to 60 detectives about his life and what he had done and how he planned his robberies, where he got his weapons, how he picked the place he was gonna rob, et cetera, et cetera. And when I first brought him on stage, I, by the way, I had a mask that he wore mm -hmm. and I called him Jesse the Robber. And 60 detectives weren't very happy to see him. But I tell you, about halfway through, he explained everything that he did and how we talked about surveillance and looking at, at the location and police and alarms and everything like that. So he gave them plenty of food for thought as to how your adversary goes about his business. And ended up this robber ended up getting a standing ovation from sixty detectives. But that's what you got to do. You got to you got to yes. do something unique. You got to change. If you're not being successful, you got to change the way you do, you're doing. Yeah. It. Yes. Well, we we see a lot today that uh, hackers get employed because they know how a hacker mind works, right? And you know, if if you are wanting to catch a criminal then you yes. need the criminal mind and you know and this is the time did you ever watch the show mind hunters yes i have uh you know the yes. the profiling happening of fbi how much of that do you think is accurate because you know i'm always fascinated with profiling and how it comes about and how important it is Well, you know, it is important. When I went to the FBI National Academy, I went there for three months with 250 police officers from throughout the United States. And the FBI at that time was looking at uh, serial murderers. Mm. And I happened to be in a homicide squad just prior to coming down to the FBI. And they had me... Uh, with uh, several of their uh, analysts and, and psychiatrists and all trying to figure out, you know, what I saw uh, in homicide. Was there a trend? Was there a certain traits that, that were unique? And uh, they became really quite good at this, this profiling. Uh, it became a very important part of the FBI. So I, th I think that's still a field that uh, obviously is going to be uh, continued advances and uh, it's going to be very helpful. Well, just like your robber, you know, saying how he did things, you know, gives gives the weaponry to to the police to what to look out for, you know, uh, you, the stitch in time. You want to be able to stop people before they commit the crime. 
And if you're aware of the patterns and, you know, the scenarios, then you can actually be in place to stop it before it actually happens. Sarah, you're right. And what happened in terrorism, there was a, uh, I think there were six or eight members out of the FAON that were captured at one time before they were about to do an armored car robbery. And the youngest of them was about 17 or 18. And they all got 50 years in jail. They went after him uh, on the uh, what's called the RICO statute. And this young man uh, was kept in contact as, as actually a assistant United States attorney, a young man himself, stayed in touch with this uh, young man from the FAOM when he was in prison. And he started to realize that he was young and he was going to spend a number of years ahead in prison. And he elected to uh, come over and work with the FBI. And I remember he came, we were in Governor's Island, which was a governor outpost. We had all our agents and detectives. And he was trained in the FALN, this Puerto Rican independence group. And <clears throat> he explained to us exactly what their tactics and techniques were. He had the training and that opened our eyes. We never re we never realized uh, how well trained they were and how committed they were that before they would go to a meeting, they would give themselves at least two hours to make sure that they weren't being surveilled. They would go on trains, off trains, on trains, go around the block, and, and it was amazing. And it was really very interesting for us when we started surveilling these people, knowing what their training had been. We had a van, in fact, two or three vans in New York at different times that were uh, riding around different parts of Manhattan, and we had a gold phone, we called it, we could stop any train in the New York City system so that we could make switches of people who believed they might have been suspected of being law enforcement so that we could put other people on the train. Uh, and our surveillance people were of all sizes and shapes. In fact, they used to kid me and say the only thing I was missing was uh, an Eskimo dwarfed, and I said there was one on order. <laughs> uh, and you know, we again we watch the movies, and you wonder how much of this is actually in practice. And you imagine, you know, nothing is out there that hasn't been thought of or isn't actually done, right? Yeah, Sarah. Yeah, but you, you got to stay alive to you know finding new ways of us doing our business because clearly they're thinking all in the same lines. Yes. Yes, true. Were you um, still working as a detective during 9-11? Actually, I was with Major League Baseball. And uh, I think they told me that they were very glad to have me in-house because of my training and background. I had 30 different stadiums that I had to make sure uh, were going to be protected and uh, our fans were, were going to not have to worry about explosions and everything else. Right. What happened, Sarah, I actually worked with all 30 stadium operation directors, with local law enforcement, with the FBI, and had a plan at each ballpark. And what I think is important, that it was not only the ballpark that I was interested in, but I enlarged the circle. I looked at how about uh, chemical uh, uh, labs that were two blocks from the stadium, uh, right. a railroad uh, that ran uh, right in back of the stadium, a major highway that was the back of another stadium. And I wanted to make sure that our stadium operation people knew that this target assessment that the these people did. They didn't 
can look at one target, looking at six or seven different targets, yeah. which one was could be accomplished, which one was going to make the, a statement for them. Uh, there was all kinds of factors. And I was training our people to have that mindset. I told them, don't be showing the same security picture at your stadium. You know, every night you've got to change things up, give them a different look. So I did, as I had told you earlier about my love for video, art. Mm -hmm. well, I got together with really bright people and put together a video called 24-7. And basically, it was about a special event, and you couldn't tell, and that's how I got their money, whether it was a football game or a hockey or whatever, they, it was a major event. And the FBI was there and Secret Service and every place, et cetera, and, and the stadium people. And what we showed was the planning of a terrorist group going after this event and what they were doing at the same time, showing the meetings of the law enforcement and security people, what they were doing right. and the, you, uh, the different uh, methods that were being used. Uh, by both to try and uh, avoid, obviously, uh, a bad outcome. You can actually say that the criminal mindset has rubbed off on you, which helped you look at solutions in a different way. Well, I tell you, coming from the South Bronx, I had a good start. <laughs> yes. <laughs> but that's the thing is one can't just think from one angle. You know, we have to look at, all angles to get the clear picture. And if you're missing a particular angle, this is where you need to reach out to people. Look, I'm seeing it from this side or that point of view. What are you seeing? Because I need to clear a picture. And instead of being in competition with each other, then everybody needs to be more open and, and in that collaboration because that's the only way you're going to get to see the whole picture and be one ahead of the criminals. Because the criminals are better funded than the police. Sarah, you're, you're absolutely right. You know, one of my first hires at Major League Baseball was a young woman who I met and saw working at uh, in, in, in Anaheim, California, at an all game. She was working for the city of Anaheim and on sports management. And I watched her for about three or four days, and I thought, wow, she at the meetings uh, that she was at uh, with our group and how smart she was and, and intuitive, et cetera, et cetera. And I said, you know what? I, 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 this is, again, the diversification that you talked about because mm -hmm. stadium operations was all men, right. okay? Well, I brought this young woman. I had to really talk her into it because she says, you know, you you're, you're giving me challenges. I don't think I can. I says, you can. And she yeah. did. And she came and there was this reluctance to deal with her. You know, the stadium operations mm -hmm. people would call me about an issue at a stadium. And I'd say, well, you have to talk to Linda. She, that's her area. Well, let me tell you, it took her about a year or two. Let me tell you something. For the next 15 years, they kept saying to me, where did you find her? Where did you get yes. her? She was outstanding. And that was important. Just what you said, brainstorming and having mm -hmm. people there who aren't on the same network as you, who they've had different experiences and they can bring together, make a plan more efficient and something that works. It's not just one person. It's a team. No, you know, and we, you know, we see this in again, movies and TV shows kind of, you know, the one person who seems to do it all, and that never works. There is no organization out there, criminal, business, uh, military, police, any hospital, everything requires levels of teamwork. And, uh, and when people feel that they can come forth with some input, that they're being able to see something from a different angle, or they're aware of something, and they don't get shut down, they get listened to, everybody benefits but if people shut people down just because they're at a lower level you're the ignorant one they're not that's uh, you know what uh sarah what i used to tell them we're all in this together yes 
and and everyone at there's equal rank at that table and people knew that, that they were going to be listened to and it's it's i never believed that i had always the best idea i wanted to they used to they were depressed when i came back from vacation because they'd have a list of things that i wanted to do but i always sat them in the conference room and we i said here's what i'm thinking about shoot me down yes. is this gonna work what do you think yeah it would work if you added this or you did. that's that's what you want that's yes. how you build good ideas yes across the board no matter what field you're in across the board right you, you want inspiration to beget invitation when you're inspired by an idea it invites other people to bring their own creativity and whether you're in law enforcement or any anything that you're in having that invitation to be part of the input everybody benefits absolutely and most importantly the person who was kind of nervous and mm -hmm doesn't know you know whether they should speak out and say it and then you take it you say you hit it that's it that's what we and and they 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 feel gratification that they're accepted they're part of the team and yes. that's so important so that they're from they're all in which is important yes really important so when did you write the book and and then the book is about your entire life career um of you know what you've done it's it, it it actually took five years to write it and what happened initially it was a combination of law enforcement and baseball and the publisher said hey you got two stories here law enforcement is really a hot issue at this point in time your experience is there that that's yes. got that's got legs for sure and baseball is going to be a great follow-up so uh, the book ends with me uh doing the i got i got uh invited to work with sports illustrated for the 1984 olympics i gave a, a presentation on domestic terrorism and they were one of the major 30 major sponsors of the Olympics in Los Angeles. And they came to me and wanted me to be with them for the Olympics. And I told them I had a real job. And I ended up talking with the director of the FBI and the New York City Police Commissioner. And they said, Kev, if you don't do it, we're going to do it. And they said, we'd love to have you out there in the middle of that pointing for the Olympics for Sports Illustrated is fine. And sure enough, that's what happened. I spent my time, unbelievable time in, in San Francisco, question in Los Angeles. And while there, I met somebody who was working with uh, the commissioner uh, who later became the commissioner of baseball, you brought. He, he told somebody at Sports Illustrated after the Olympics that tell Kevin they're looking for somebody at baseball and he ought to throw his hat in the ring. So mm -hmm. uh, I did. And uh, believe me, Sarah, there were people that more high ranking than I was that that certainly could have had the job and I'm sure would have done well. I was fortunately, I had a very diversified career. I think the book that's illustrated the mm -hmm. that and that's what helped get the. Uh... But it's also the ability to not just be one channel. You're working on many channels. You're interested in what does the criminal do what does the terrorists look at you know or what you know what uh, what do the public see you're willing to look at things from all different angles and so you know it doesn't matter if somebody's this rank or that rank if they're only one channel that's all they can do you want somebody that's willing to turn from one channel to the next you know to to really actually understand the whole station so that is that's where the aptitude was the ability the experience but they, you know, opening up to whatever means I'm going to get my knowledge, I'm going to be open to it. Sarah, uh, chief of detectives told me he played golf with the uh, new police, a new baseball commissioner at that time. And he said the commissioner had asked about me. This was before I was hired. And he told the commissioner that I was a boat rocker. And, uh, I didn't know whether he helped me or hurt me, but it turned out 
that the commissioner wanted a boat rocker because that's what I that's what I do. Can can it run faster? Can we do this? Can we do that? I'm always questioning, and I think uh, there were many FBI, Secret Service people. I was I was truly diversified, mm. and of course, the Olympics, you know, gave me another uh, feather in my cap. So it's and and I had the interest, and the commissioner you wrote, wrote a book after the Olympics called Made in America. I read it three times before I went for the interview <laughs> to make sure that I had to understand who he was and what he needed. So. I'm sure that helped me. Mm. But, you know, if I used to get a lot of flack because I would see the things missing. And I've been in situations where my bosses were fired and I was offered the job. And I don't want the job. I just want my boss to listen that this is what's missing, you know, and they wouldn't listen. So it would be brought up, or, you know, at the boardroom. And then, well, why didn't you see that? You know, and it's like, it's just some people have the ability to see the missing links. And if you can see the missing links or you know that this person's important and that person's important in the equation and you're not afraid to go after it, then, you know, then that's going to see you well in life. Because quite honestly, that uh, flexibility, adaptability, adoptability, you know, all of that versatility is really what makes somebody successful in any realm? Well, Sarah, it helped me, and I have to mention this about Canada. I was did a lot of work in Montreal before the Expos left town. I did a lot of work in Toronto. I have some really terrific friends in in, the, in Toronto police agencies, the Royal Canadian Mounted, uh, the whole group. They were tremendously helpful to me when I put in a program when I first got into baseball called the Resident Security Agent Program. Again, part of my being proactive, a police officer in each jurisdiction working as a part-time security consultant with each team, not doing police work, mm -hmm. but making sure that baseball's procedures are being followed. And they were alcohol management, crowd control, looking at things like that. And it was resisted immediately by baseball operations people. They said, Sarah, they said, we don't need a cop in our kitchen. Well, I thought they did. Well, that program I put in in 1987 and those, that, those jurisdictions, those departments are still supplying police officers. Over a thousand police officers have gone through the program. And the good news was, Sarah, I showed them that a simple cop like me in New York <laughs> could grow up to be a security director. And they certainly had the same or more potential. And to get their education, as I did in the police department, while I was being active and involved, and they could do the same thing. And many of them have gone on to the very, very successful careers. So I'm really proud uh, to have been part of the success. Many of these, and by the way, men and women mm -hmm. have had, I brought women into the program as well. Excellent. You know, we, we don't understand crowd control until we watch the news of what happened in Seoul just the other day, uh, where, you know, the 110 people dead from crushing each other to death because of crowding. And people think, you know, um, oh, well, so what if everybody leaves at once? Or so what if this or so what if that? And we don't realize, especially if there's any form of scare tactic, you know, whether terrorist or a gunshot or fire or this or that, you know, you've got people that will panic. And if you don't have strategies in order for people to exit, uh, clearly, trampling on each other will happen we see this in england in football stadiums and it it happens if the if the management isn't there so you know it's not just about the counter-terrorism it's also about the management of of the crowd itself sarah in 1986 when i came to baseball watch i saw 30, 40,000 people take the field, players running for their lives, et cetera. And Peter Ubrow said to me the next day, 
that can never happen again. And I absolutely agreed. And I made a point while I was in Major League Baseball, I took control of that situation. And the, for the World Series, which was at Chase Stadium in New York, over 50,000 people there, and an exciting game. I had planned from top to bottom with NYPD and the Mets security, and we had a plan of action. We had, I admit, 80 mounted horses from the mounted unit and NYPD that at the end of that game, those 80 horses were on the field along with the police officers, not waiting until the last minute, but positioned mm -hmm. to go on the field, okay? And the security people in the stands working with us to make sure they were at the exit uh, to the, uh, that could exit the field if they, if they uh, uh, wanted to. But everybody was schooled. Mm -hmm. We were there for days and making sure everybody was on the same page. And if you see that 86 World Series tape of that seventh game of the World Series, nobody got on the field. The players celebrated on the field, and that's what got everybody saying, we've got to let the players have that celebration, yes. let the fans see it. In fact, it got so good that now – we decided that the players were going back in the clubhouse and celebrating pouring champagne over each other. We had the presentation of the World Series trophy presented on the field because the field was secure. And that's the way you do business. And right. we were able to attain that. Yeah. And, you know, whenever there's a disaster, there's a lesson learned. You know, as you said, that can't happen again. What can we do to prevent it? And prevention is far better than cure. And it, it allows yeah. everybody to enjoy things without the fear of. And this is the thing. You, whether somebody's running for their life or whether people are living in exaltation, you know, uh, people kind of get carried away. And it's not to dampen their spirits or the, the exuberance of the moment, but it is to make sure that it still stays orderly. Absolutely. And, you know, I bring another, after 9-11, the World Series game was played in Arizona and New York, and we worked feverishly in both stadiums to make sure it was going to be right. Well, the game at Yankee Stadium was going to be the third game, and the president was coming. And everybody, the media was hyping it up that this is, you know, after 9-11, I mean, this is, you know, this September 11th and now October, the World Series, and the president's coming and you're going to have 50,000 people. They interviewed me. I mean, I can tell you how many, in fact, I had to cut it off because I, I couldn't do my job. <laughs> but I told the media at that time, that I couldn't be more confident in our ability to make sure it was going to be a safe environment, that I wanted this to be not a security event, but a baseball game. And we had the best of the best in Secret Service, the FBI, NYPD, and security experts working with us to make sure that we had everything in place because after 9-11, mm -hmm. we just could not have another tragedy and everything. It was a great game. The president was there. He he threw a strike <laughs> from, <laughs> from the mound. Everybody was concerned about that. But uh, it all worked. But again, everybody working together. Not a one-man show. Right. Everybody working together. And that's... We all had a responsibility, a major responsibility, and everybody performed. And, you know, one of the things I think that needs to be held accountable is media. They love, you know, I say they take a pimple and make it into a volcanic eruption. They blow things out of proportion, and they've got to take ownership of how much hysteria and fear they're inciting. Um, because when you ask people to be calm, to, to look more at the joyous or the possibilities of the solutions instead of the problems or build, stirring things up, uh, they create many of the problems with the, the shoot stirring. It's, uh, it's been a problem. But, you know, one thing that I will not allow 
I will not allow them to succeed either. Most importantly, we want to make sure that we're complete at our job. We're not perfect. We've okay. got to make sure that we're just doing the best we can across the board. And that, as we talked earlier, everybody that's working with us can can say, hey, what about this? Did we forget? I mean, whatever. Yes. We we, we can miss something. And it's really important. And I, I in fact, invite my NFL hockey, basketball, security chiefs to come to all of my events and take a look at what I'm doing. And if I, if I miss something, I missed it. Hmm. And quite honestly, they took me up on it and, and it started bringing me, I got to more Super Bowls and <laughs> state Cup. I mean, it, it's terrific, but it was a working relationship that we cared about each other. And that's quite honestly what helped when I started getting in with them to the video business and because they found out with their players too, when their mm-hmm. players saw what we were able to do and it was about their careers that they realized that we were not in it for ourselves. We were in it for them and for the sport. You know, when we look at counterterrorism, everybody always immediately looks at the outside attack on America, but really there's more kind of terrorism that really happens inside And, you know, this is the thing we need to look at what terrorism is and whether it's on a very small scale or whether it's on a very large scale, uh, it has to be addressed and it has to be looked at and treated properly. Because if you don't, then it becomes the massive scale. And so, you know, for people, oh, terrorism, it's, it's only, you know, people who attack America. We have to see what's going on right now, January 6th and numerous other things going on. This is domestic terrorism going on. That means it's happening within the country. And that means that terrorism is having a detrimental effect on the people and the ripple effect that it is happening. So when we look at counterterrorism today, we have to look across the board at everything, don't you? Yes, uh, that, that you're absolutely right. It's, it's really important. And unfortunately, uh, and disturbingly, the January 6th was a clear indication of what could have happened. If someone from the Capitol Police actually had opened fire on some of the uh, uh, trespassers, if you will, that could have set off a whole, because sure, the God, God made apples that uh, they had weapons. Yes, and, uh, it could have been a slaughter. It would have been, it really would have been a nightmare. So the Capitol Police, uh, they did a tremendous job under great pressure and obviously suffered the consequences of, uh, you know, holding the ground. But uh, uh, the good news I, I, that night, of course, was the fact that we got the Congress to meet and uh, business was taken care of. And uh, there's concern, as you, I'm sure, have been reading with these uh, uh, midterm uh, yes. elections. But you know what? We still believe... And I do believe, and maybe I'm a glass half full guy. Uh, Americans are really good people. We're not any better than anybody else for sure, but we we have an unbelievable country. We have unbelievable freedoms, and I think that uh, the majority of people uh, are still, you know, loyal Americans. And uh, I think would be dismayed if, if uh, as they were, I'm sure, and disappointed with January 6th. So clearly, I think we have to take stock of our country and, and, and what we want. And there's going to be these dissidents, as there is everywhere, uh, that are going to try and uh, uh, get their goals achieved. But uh, I think this country is still strong and uh, that uh, uh, the good people are going to carry the day. I hope so. Um, it is really predicted and uh, that there is some form of revolution that is going to happen and we know that it will be violent because the dissidents speak with guns um and i think it's again the invitation to the rest of the american people uh who cares if you're black and white pink yet polka dot or what your religion is or what your political party is you're americans you're human beings sharing this country and uh, no one has the right to terrorize somebody else uh, because of it. And I think it's, it's a call to everyone to stand up, not with pitchforks, but, you know, arm and arm together, uh, you know, unified, because 
United States of America is becoming divided states of America. And if you want it to be united again, that means people cannot sit back on the buying lines. They've got to stand up. And uh, as I said, not with the angst, not with the guns, not with the pitchforks, but together, uh, you know, with respect and love for one another and love for their country. Well, you said it. You said it best, and and uh, truly, uh, that's my prayer. Mm. I'm right with you there, love. Right with you. Now, over the wall, um, the dangerous streets of New York City through the birth of counterterrorism and counterterrorism and beyond. Uh, also, um, co-written by Rob. Um, Rob, what's his surname? Rob, 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 Rob. Um, you're, you're, you're working on it. I'm working on it. I need my glasses on. Uh, <laughs> I hope I'm pronouncing his name right. Uh, Travelino. Um, yes, we got it. And uh, so he's a contributor of it as well. And uh, so this is the first book. Uh, does that mean there's going to be a second book on the baseball? Well, uh, actually, Sarah, we're, we're hoping if the sales are good with this book, and it seems that uh, so far Amazon is indicating that, it, that it's doing well. So uh, my sense of it is that, that that's probably going to happen at some point in time. But I think... As you know, law enforcement's under a lot of pressure. I'm hoping that this book can be somewhat of a rallying cry to those who are thinking about law enforcement, can read this book and see really what a rewarding career it is. And, and it's all about service. And yes. I think that when people realize that we need a lot of good folks, men and women, to come into this occupation and be difference makers. Yes. 100% agree with you. And uh, it really does take the village, you know, to make the village strong. Uh, and people can also get hold of you, you know, through your Facebook, you're, you're on Facebook, your name, Kevin Halliman, H-A-L-L-I-N-A-N. And they can find you there as well. Uh, you're also on Twitter as well, right? Yes, correct. Uh, and uh, over the wall one. And uh, so people can follow you there as well. And of course, uh, they can also go to your site uh, well, the site for the book, which is uh, Post Hill Press. And all of the links here are on your show page. So all the people have to do is selfdiscoverymedia.com and put in your name. Again, Kevin, M-H-A-L-L-I-N-A-N. -L -L -N, and everything will come up. And the book is found on Amazon. And, uh, and uh, you know, this is a very good educational read I think for the family, you know, for for kids that may be on the cusp thinking that being a gangster is, is cool or crime is cool or I do want to go into law enforcement or I do want to look at security in some manner because, you know, you can put out a manual on how to, but nothing speaks louder than someone's life experience. And you have had a very diverse life experience across the board, and it's led you to start things that have become mainstream and changed lives quite considerably. So I think this book should certainly be in, uh, in the educational system as well, and very much spoken about all aspects of it, from you know the street cop, knowing people on the street, right up to the counter, terrorism, to the special units, the protecting sports teams, the whole works. It's a really good educational book for everybody across the board to actually even also see the history of America and its evolution in, uh, in security and police work. So thank you for writing it. I hope you write the second one. And then I want you to come back and share that one with us as well. And, uh, you know, thank you for, for all, all the service that you have given us through the years. Sarah, thank you so very much. It, it was a great conversation. And uh, I feel quite honest, we, we, we just read the book together. So <laughs> then, uh, oh, the details are in the book, though. <laughs> People need to read the book. This was just a teaser. But, uh, you know, you've certainly done a lot. And that's because you were open-minded, open-hearted, willing to work with other people, and were able to see between the cracks. You weren't a black and white person. You, you know, you saw all colors. And that's what we need out of people today, especially out of leaders. And you're an exemplary leader. So thank you so much. Thank you. And, you know, um, veteran 
police officer or veterans out there, anybody that is a veteran out there in any of our services, they've given up a lot in their life. Uh, even the things they've had to see, the things they've had to do, the things they've had to witness, it's, um, it's been very, very costly on them in many, many ways. So don't forget to support our veterans, uh, whether it's the police force, the military, the Navy, the paramedics, any of the people, the firemen, all of the people that are on the front lines, because without them, where would we be? Until next time, folks, bye for now. We hope that you enjoyed the show. Find all of our shows on selfdiscoverymedia.com under podcasts or selfdiscoverymedia slash shows. And for all our current shows, go to What's New. We are supported by you, the audience. You will see a nice big shiny blue button for one-time donations or follow us on Patreon and you will be able to support us there. We enjoy bringing you such wisdom. And the next show will be up in just a moment.